Hello, this is Dr. Bats. Again, today I wish I could be talking to you about one of my more um, whimsical and, and, and fun endeavors. However, in light of recent events uh, surrounding the coronavirus, uh, several groups that I'm affiliated with inquired about what should we do? Should we be concerned? And, and what are some strategies to reduce that risk? So this video will outline uh, some of the things that you've probably seen on the news uh, as well as in other venues, but hopefully uh, answer some questions and enlighten uh, what the virus is, what we should be concerned about and ways to keep us safe. Now, let me apologize. We're doing this as quickly as we can so you may hear some background noise. I'll give this disclaimer. This is not um, medical uh, advice. Uh, let me say that again, this is not medical advice per se, this is informational. I would suggest that if you have further questions that you see your primary care doctor uh, or another healthcare professional to assist you in navigating what your risk is and what should happen. So I know you've heard again, the coronavirus or COVID-19. When you think about the two of those things, coronavirus is the actual virus. COVID is the is the disease state that one can has. Now, coronavirus in and of itself is not a, a new thing for us. Now, this strain or this type is, and let me let me say this up front, um, th I'm a cardiologist, right? But uh, just in lieu of the fact that many po folks have asked me about it um, over the past several days, um, I've kind of delved into the literature surrounding uh, previous coronaviruses as well as current. We're backing up a step again coronavirus um, we've seen it before there is MERS or Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome as well as uh, SARS uh, basically sudden acute respiratory syndrome both of those are thought to be caused by coronavirus coronavirus right is the actual pathogen or the virus COVID-19 is the disease state co is corona V is the virus um, VI is the virus and D is disease. 19 is the is the year. 2019 is the year in which it was delineated. So when we look at um, coronavirus and, and how it works, this is a virus that typically affects the respiratory system, right? So how we breathe and what we do. And so individuals with underlying lung disease are particularly um, at higher risk. But something that caught my attention was individuals with any um, you know, let's say past medical uh, condition, and we'll talk about those a little bit later, place them or predisposes them to a much higher risk in terms of what one could expect from coronavirus. We have to say, well, well you know, Dr. Betts, we, we have influenza and we have flu and we navigate that and this, you know, flu kills more people. And that's what I was saying very, very early on. And that is a true statement. When we look at the numbers specifically um, for this particular virus, it has moved into pandemic states. So what pandemic is, pandemic is essentially an epidemic, meaning that a, a problem that has occurred in a particular geographic region outside of proportions of what you would think an outbreak would be, and then spread to multiple areas. Right now, we know that COVID-19 is in over 100 countries after starting in a province or in a place in, in China, so to speak, as far as we know. Um, in so that, we, we anticipate the progression and rate of progression of the virus to be particularly problematic. Uh, when we look at uh, you know what makes um, coronavirus compared to other viruses, early on when we looked at the virus, there were somewhere about 8,000 to 10,000 cases with uh, about 170 to 200 deaths. And so that made its fatality rate somewhere around two to three percent. Um, at that point, it was in 20 countries. And, it, and, it, and again, we anticipated that that would be the fatality rate. To give you um, some context, uh, you can see this graphic here. It identifies some of the more uh, major uh, viruses. You can see the H5N1 bird flu, again, a fatality rate of 52%. Uh, SARS, a fatality rate of 9%. H1N1, 17%, and again, over a million, um, 1.5 uh, cases. So again, it still is one of those things we're concerned about, but we're catching this virus, or we, we hope we've caught this virus early. And when I say caught, I mean identifying. We're still navigating through how to test and, and what to do uh, in these settings. So when we think about virulence or, or what makes a, back, a virus pathogenic, in terms of that, we look at that and say, how many people um, that are infected with the virus actually manifest symptoms? 
On the flip side, what we also like to characterize with the virus is what is uh, its overall fatality rate, meaning that you take the number of deaths over the number of people infected with the virus. So that number right now for COVID-19, again, is nothing to, to shake a stick at, so to speak. Um, it is you know, two to 3%. However, when we look at certain populations, that fatality rate actually balloons up to as high as 15%. And again, we'll talk about those a little later on uh, as we move forward. So the symptoms of coronavirus um, are similar to previous. As I mentioned, you know, you had Middle Eastern uh, respiratory syndrome and, and severe acute respiratory syndrome. Again, with symptoms uh, occurring or common symptoms being fever, you know, after about two or three days, individuals may develop a dry cough. There may be mild breathing uh, difficulties early on, gastrointestinal issues, diarrhea, body aches, and so very nonspecific. However, the rapid progression of these symptoms to respiratory failure requiring um, you know, ag aggressive medical support is what's concerning about this virus and, and how it manifests itself. After hearing about symptoms and what can happen there, you know, we may be asking, well, well am I at risk or, or who should I be concerned about in regards to the coronavirus and what we should do in that regard? So who is at risk? So the first risk group that we can easily identify is age. Right now, we haven't identified any severe cases or based on the data that I'm looking at, any severe cases in young people, right? Individuals, and you can see by the graphic, uh, people less than, let's say, you know, 20 years old. We haven't seen any significant cases. Now, some of that may be reporting. However, when you get around that 60 years old age, again, that risk or that fatality rate that we talked about earlier increases from three then the next decade we go to 10 and then beyond that we're as high as you know, 21 percent in terms of confirmed death cases um, for individuals that are older than 80 years old so this is a a big concern moving forward the next group or category that you think about um, when you think about the total death toll of corona right now it is 4,633 um, as of 12 March. Uh, we talked about age as being one of those risk factors. The other area that we're concerned about is pre-existing diseases. And this is where I had to become a bit more interested because as we looked at pre-existing conditions or pre-existing illnesses, cardiovascular disease, the most common disease internationally, was at the top of the list. And what we see by this graphic is patients with cardiovascular disease again have a 13 percent death rate when compared to let's say patients with hypertension chronic respiratory disease or diabetes this is exceedingly concerning when you look at patients who have no pre-existing condition their overall again death rate based on this graphic um, is less than one percent or normative you know that two to three percent that we've seen so far so for my patients i i'm still trying to navigate how best to approach this so as we look at risk and, and as we look at, you know, things going on, I know it seems like um, we're inundated with this data and, and there's no way we can respond to it. There's nothing we can do. Well, that's where we can make a difference. So the question that you're asking now is probably, well, what can I do? Well, the first thing is personal awareness, right? The fact that you're watching this video, the fact that you're tuned in to TV stations, radio, and, and trying to get as much data as you can to, to read about coronavirus, it's allowing you to broaden your perspective in understanding what needs to happen. So personal awareness and self-awareness in terms of identifying, hey, I have one of those pre-existing conditions. Hey, I probably should, you know, take better precautions in, in hand washing in making sure that I'm covering my mouth when I cough and making sure that I'm limiting my exposure to other individuals that might be sick. What people with severe illness from COVID-19 should do, it comments that again, if you fall into one of those high risk categories, stock up on supplies, take everyday precautions, um, avoid crowds, avoid travel and any unnecessary air travel that you see. And during a COVID-19 outbreak in your community, stay at home as much as possible. Now this creates some problems because as I mentioned, I was preparing to go to my fraternity uh, 100th uh, year anniversary of when our chapter was founded, the, the U University of Kansas Mu chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity. But again, they contacted me with concerns that some of our members who would be returning 
yes, fell into those high risk groups. Again, these were thoughts that we had moving forward. And so what could our response be to be proactive? So the CDC has outlined and designed strategies for faith-based groups, community organizations to take strategies to lower their risk. Now, as you can see in the graphic, these strategies outlined by the CDC include essentially three phases, right? There's a preparedness phase, a minimal to moderate so-called so risk phase, and a substantial risk phase. So at best, I would say that we're in the minimal to moderate phase. And what they say is reduce activities. Consider offering audio slash video events to decrease exposures. You know, determine ways that you can continue to support individuals, but work towards decreasing those services. Cancel large gatherings, and they characterize large gatherings as gatherings of greater than 250 people. And for organizations with severe high-risk populations, cancel gatherings of more than 10 people. Yes, that is correct. For groups that have high-risk individuals, the CDC recommends that you cancel gatherings of more than 10 people. So what that means, and I don't know, I'm in discussions with my, my pastor at church to say how best, because when I look at the demographic of our church, um, we just do not want to expose them to any undue risk that may occur by having. Them. As you can see, again, this is a graphic that the CDC has designed for community organizations and groups that we'll talk about a little bit later, but they have it designed. It is free. It is available. Um, I'll leave the link here uh, so you can see Well, not the link, but the web address. I'll figure out how to leave the link a little bit later, but it talks about mitigation strategies, containment strategies for those groups. After personal awareness, another strategy is to look at policy specific strategies. So there are three levels and, and one is somewhat of an outdated term, but it will help us to understand these strategies. So these strategies involve mitigation, containment, and quarantine. Quarantine is an older strategy, meaning that you keep um, infected people away. And then mitigation is where you identify risk. And from identifying risk, you move in a strategy to decrease that risk moving forward. So many of the strategies we're going to talk about uh, a little later with community and faith based organizations are in more of a mitigation strategy. Nationally, uh, with the movement of the uh, NC2A, the NBA, uh, other large uh, sporting events, they've moved into a strategy to some degree of containment and mitigation. The coronavirus is, is not uh, new per se, but this strain or this approach, and as I mentioned, I'm a cardiologist, um, is different. How rapidly it spreads, um, how significant the symptoms are, um, are concerning in that sense. That said, it doesn't have to be something that, uh, you know, creates a, a sense of fear. However, it should embolden us to be more aware of our surroundings, more aware of our own risk factors and move in a direction to where we protect ourselves as well as, as, well as those in our communities. Strategies towards self-awareness, understanding mitigation, containment, and in some cases even quarantine that have been dictated by the local authorities might be important also. And then finally, as simple as possible, making sure that if you're sick, you alert your primary care physician or primary care provider. If you know someone else is sick, reduce your interactions with those individuals. If you can do things to improve um, you know, how well you limit where you go, again, what we call social distancing. Um, and these are all easy strategies. They don't you know, force you to go out and buy anything. These are all things that you can do on your own. Hopefully on a weekly basis, I can provide you updates. I can tell you that the CDC is, is doing a great job. And again, they have a, a website where you can look at the updates of, unfortunately, the death tolls, uh, where the coronavirus is spread in the United States, you know, mitigation strategies, containment strategies that they've implemented. So again, kudos to the CDC. Thank you for all you do. And hopefully we can continue to work to make this be a manageable issue. Again, thank you. Have a delightful day.